Next one is also something that I suffer from. Like I have, I am very biased. So every time I have to do configuration, I have to do, I usually opt for doing like text proto buffs. Um, so I really like to see uh, a good configuration management engine. Thank you. So I have the awkward position to be between you and your lunch. I'm sorry for that. Um, this talk is on configuration management. So my name is Silvan. I'm a data scientist at Silke. And as data scientists, we have a lot of challenges in the configuration management. What is configuration management? So basically, when you write the program, you get configuration from different sources. Like we have seen before that you have paths hard-coded in the script. That's what you for sure do not want. And that's why we get this configuration from outside. This can be configuration files. It can be environment variables, especially for secrets. It can be command line, command line arguments, as you have seen before. So all of this is like configuration who tells our program how to behave. In basically every program, we write the same few steps. So we somehow load this config, we parse it, uh, we validate it, we persist it, and then we distribute it to our different software component. I mean, usually that's not a big deal. You've seen before, arc parse, three to four lines, perfect, you're fine. But as the software grows, and especially in data science projects, configs tend to get really large. I mean, with the model config, training config, validation config, maybe you have some cloud connectors, maybe you have even like, um, vaults, like secret vaults for your keys somewhere in the cloud and so on. So this can become quite complex. And at some point, it's actually worth it to invent a library. And that's what we actually did. I mean, there are, again, a lot of libraries already for configuration management. We also evaluated them. But we did not like find the sweet stuff spot. It was like there was also something missing. Like either they had only very specific sources. For example, you have seen with arc parse, it's really just meant for arguments. I mean, it's not does not want to solve all these problems you have seen here, or validation, multiple environment, ID support. So there was always something missing. That's why we thought, OK, there are 10 competing standards. Let's invite an 11th. And that's what we did. And we wrote ConfSet. So ConfSet is a configuration management library we developed at Zilke. Um, it's open source, so it's under the MIT license. Anyone can use it. It's, uh, we developed it like a year ago and continuously improved it. Um, yeah, it's on GitHub. You see, the world has not like waited for this library, but it's also not completely unpopular. And maybe if everyone gives a star, it's already twice as large. I mean, and it has, of course, documentation and read the docs, and you can install it with pip or also with conigo, of course. So, what's it about? And we will first go into like the basic principles, and then also look a bit under the hood because I think it's quite interesting. So. Some of you might know Pydantic. For those who don't, it's basically data classes, but with validation and rich types. In Pydantic, we will see it afterwards, you can define a data class, but you have way more types than the standard types you know from Python, and you get validation. So you cannot just put any data in these data classes. They have to be correct. Basically, um, ConfSet is just a, la a layer around Pydantic. So it allows to load the data from the sources. That's what Pydantic cannot do. And then it passes it to Pydantic. And Pydantic then does all the validation, persisting, and so on. And we don't do a caching. We'll see this later with lazy loading, how this works. Um, it allows for a heterogeneous set of sources. We see this afterwards, like with environment variables, command line arguments, constants, and so on. And it's easily extendable. As I said, if you have keys in the cloud somewhere on Azure Key Vault, just write an extension, and you can load them from them. And you have like, special support for multiple environments and testing, because we have seen how important testing is before. So instead of going like into a programmatic approach and how everything is set up, we just look at how can you use it by examples, see how it behaves, and then we look a bit under the hood and see why it can behave the way it does. So that's the basic usage, and that's, I guess, whenever you want to use ConfSet, you just need to know this in theory. So we have here an example. We have a database configuration. It consists of a user and a password. So we have here... Um, it inherits from ConfSet. So that's what you write. You define how a config looks like. Because, I mean, you as a programmer, of course, knows how your config looks like. And you can define, you can use standard Python types like string, or also a bit more special types like the secret string from Pydantic. It's basically a string, but it will not just print. So if you, on accident, like dump your DB config onto the console, or it's even so log file, it will not be there in plain sight. So it's a bit hidden, and which is a good thing here. And then if the API config, for example, here in this example, we code an API and we say, well, our API, it runs at some host, it has some port, and it connects to its own database. And the database is configured by the database config. So far, this was actually plain pedantic, so it's not special. But now we add this um, class variable config sources here, where we define 
where this config is stored. And this is just one example. We see many more examples later where we say, well, all this config is actually stored in this YAML file here at path.config. And that's actually all you need from now on. Whenever you need some of these config variables, wherever you are in, in your system, you can just like import this config and just directly instantiate and load it and access the values. And under the hood, when you access one of these values, it gets loaded from the file and later on it will be persisted. So it only loads it once, of course. It also loads it only at the first access. It will not load it already at the import because that's bad practice then. And actually that's all you need to do to use confset um, in a like very basic, thing, basic sense. As I said, um, it has some caching and lazy loading. So when you instantiate API config, for example, twice, here we have the is operator, which checks for identity in the sense of if it's really at the same memory location, not just if the values are correct. And that's then true in this case. And also, if you try to overwrite it, it will fail because um, the config should be immutable in this case. And you can use the full power of Pydantic. So if whatever you want to do with this config, maybe drop it as a JSON somewhere, whatever, you can use all the methods Pydantic provides. For example, here, the JSON serialization. As I said before, we have for certain scenarios a bit more functionalities, for example, multiple environments. Maybe we have like our local dev environment, we have a staging environment, we have a production environment, we can have a lot of environments. And we might, for example, have different config files for these different environments. And that's no problem in ConfSec. The only thing you need to do is instead of defining a file, you just define a folder and then tell Pydantic the source of where it should know what environment to use. So this example, it will read the environment variable environment and then look, look at the value here and then read the config file, which is in the folder with the name of the environment variable. So that's all you need. And now we get, went from a single environment setup to a multi-environment setup. We've already seen that this config source is, is quite flexible. It actually is. It can also be a list, and then it will go through the different sources, and later configs can overwrite, later sources can overwrite earlier ones. So for example, here we also have an environment source. So we say, well, you can use environment variables, you can use all of them, so allow all is true. And instead of using the real environment variables, you can also, for example, use a .env file, if you again like files. And if it's not here, then it really uses the real environment variables. And you can also say, well, afterwards, look at the command line arguments, look at all the command line arguments which start with conf, and if there is some of these defined, then overwrite this. And with these two line of codes, we can actually define our um, application with environment variables, but then overwrite them with command line arguments. So for example, if you're on AWS SageMaker and you do some hyperparameter testing, you will get the hyperparameters as command line arguments, and then the only thing you need to add is this one, and then it will be correctly verified and parsed. We have so far always seen this global config. Um, this is not always a thing you want to have, especially if the application gets very large. It lies, has this singleton thing, which uh, is not, not always very nice. And so what you can also do, instead of having this config sources class variable, you can just define standard configs like here. So this is now really like Pydantic, but instead of inheriting from Pydantic paste settings, you inherit from confset. And then by instantiating this class, you can provided with config sources. And this is now, it has the same power as before as the class variable config sources, but it's now a key line, a command line argument. No, sorry, a class, an instantiation variable, yes. And you can also like combine this with traditional um, keyword arguments here. Like you can even just use it as if it would just be a data class or a pedantic base model. So you can do all the combinations here. Now we have some configuration. Um, we have this maybe like a lo small database locally, but for testing. Very often, we want to override certain configuration for testing. And that's also something which is supported. So we have here an example. We have our configuration, which just consists of a number, which is usually read from a file. It's maybe not the most interesting configuration in this example. Um, and then you can just read this number and it will be printed. I mean, this is now a small script here as an example. But now if you go to testing, you might want to override this number. That's actually possible. So you can just define new sources. So we say, well, we now have a data source. So the source of the configuration is a constant, which is in this dictionary defined here. And then every conf set config class allows to override the config with a context manager. So you can just call my config .change config sources and give it the new source. And then within this context, it will load the new source and use the new source. And then it comes to here, we have 42. And once you leave the Python context, um, you get 
back to the old variable and have the number from the config file again. So this is very hel helpful if you need for testing to override certain stuff. And with the context manager, you make sure that you do this very locally and do not affect other unit tests, for example, and so on. Yes, this was very fast. Um, we now go under the hood. You have already heard the teaser of meta classes and that we should not use them in Python. Actually, we had to use them in this project, but what is a Python meta class? And um, to me, it was very new, and I thought it would be maybe interesting to show this here. So what is meta programming first? So meta program is a bit like a, a concept, like it sounds very like general AI and whatever. It's like the potential for a program to have knowledge of or man man manipulate itself. So it sounds very, very advanced. But actually, meta classes are everywhere in Python. So they're always there, you just do not see them. And according to Tim Peters, one of the original C Python implementers, you actually do not need to care about them in most cases. So he writes here that like 99% of our users should not care about it. And if you ever wonder if you need them, you don't. And only if you really know that you need them, then you will see. So this keep list in mind, you will probably not delete them in your daily work, but I think understanding them really helps to understand the internals of Python. So it really helps to understand what is actually going on when I write the Python program. And I mean, there's some intuitive description and we will see this afterwards. So a meta class is to a class the same as a class is to an instance. So this might, what does this mean? Well, you might have heard that in Python, everything is an object. And here we have an example of what this means. So if we define some class foo, and this is now completely detached from conf set, you see afterwards how this glues together. Um, we define some class foo, and then we create an instance x, and then we look at what's the type of x. Well, no surprise, the type of x is the class foo. Then we might ask ourselves, okay, and what is then the type of foo, or what is the type of the type of x? And then we say, well, the type is type, okay. And what is then the type of type, or the type of the type of the type of x? And well, it's again type. So we see here this pattern. So x is of type foo, foo is of type type, and actually type is of type itself. So we end up with an infinite loop. And this is um, usual, that's not surprising. But now meta classes come in. So meta classes allow you like to define your own type. So we have here an example. We define a meta class called meta. It's nothing to do with the Facebook concern. And it inherits from type, meaning that it's a meta class. And then we define the same class foo again. But now we say, well, the meta class is meta. So if you don't define it, the meta class is like type. But now we specifically define it. Then we again create an instance. Now something interesting happens. So because now what is the type of x? It's foo, not surprising. But what is now the type of foo? So the type of the type of x. And this is now actually meta, so it's no longer type. And then the type of meta is then again type. So we have here this new meta. So x is of type foo, foo is of type meta, and meta is of type type. So, I mean, that's a nice thing. We can do this. We did not gain a lot by doing so at the moment. And, but now it's really interesting to see, well, First of all, what happens if we create an instance in Python? I mean, that's not as surprising, maybe, depending on how much you already know about Python. But if you have this script here, like you have class definition start, class definition end, I hope it's readable by the size. And then you have these two magic methods, new and init, which you can always define and call. And now if I create an instance of x, so what happens? That's basic Python. What happens? Well, the Python interpreter goes through it. I mean, even though we don't like script, it's always a script. We go through it, class definition start, class definition, class definition ends. And then, since we create an instance of x, first new is called. So new um, forces us to create an instance of the class. So we have to return an instance of this class. Um, if we write define the function new, if we don't, then this happens under the hood. And then init is called. So we have to have this new instance here, which is now passed here to us, and we have to initialize it. And so we have init start, init end, and then we also call x. And x, the calling of x, then calls this um, magic method call, which then is here class called. So that's not new, um, but it's very nice to see this comparing to what happens with meta classes. Because let's say we have exactly the same class foo, but we have our meta class here. So we have the class meta of type type. And it has also, we can say it has a new, it has an init, and it has a call. 
And again, with new, we have meta new start, meta new end, meta init start, meta init end, and meta called and meta called end. And then our foo, where we have the cluster efficient start, then we define foo as of type meta, and then we have the things from before, and then class definition end. So what happens now if we run this program? And actually, it's very interesting. So we have class definition start, and then we have a function description. And now we see that actually under the hood, stuff happens. So really, Python, it's an interpreter. It goes through the language, like through the program, line by line. It sees, OK, class definition start. I have a class foo, which is of meta class meta. This means I have to define a new class. This means I have to create an instance of the type of this class, which is meta. And we see now the exactly the same behavior. We have like meta new start, meta new end, meta init start, meta init end, where our meta class forces us to create a new class and then initialize this class. And then the class definition is handed. So by just defining a class, things happened under the hood and Python like created this class by instantiating the type of this class, which is meta in this class, in this type. And then the same thing happens as before. First, this happens. So now meta is called. So when you remember here, we create an instance of foo. And I mean, if you look at this, what we actually do is we call the type, we call the class. And that's what actually happens. So the class is called, sorry, the type is called, and then it gives back the instance. So we have created the class from the type, and then we create the instance from the class. And then the things happen as before. So we have the class new start and class init start. And then again, meta is called, like it's ending here. So all this instantiation of the type happens within the call function of the meta type. And then we're done. And then again, we have the class called here because here we called x. So we see it's really a meta class is to a class the same as the class is to an instance. It's really just an instance. And by defining a class, we actually instantiate the meta class. The same as by creating an instance of a class, we instantiate the class. And what can we do with this? So far, it was nice to see. I mean, nice that Python works this way, but also we wouldn't really need to know. I mean, why would we care? There are some things we could do with this. I mean, here this dummy example, so we could just add an attribute. I mean, it's not something you would really want, but it shows nicely that you have the full freedom to manipulate these classes as you want. This doesn't mean that you should do so because it gets very intransparent what happens. But we see this here, like we have this meta class and we say, well, whenever a class is created, which has as meta class meta, it should add a class attribute called new attribute. And then we have here foo, it's an empty class, but still by just saying it's the meta class meta, foo has now like a class variable new attribute, which is also an instance variable new attribute here. So we can manipulate these classes. And uh, I would say like the most popular example for this are singletons. So when you search for how to do singletons in Python, you might have done so. You end up on Stack Overflow with a post with so many upvotes. And there is an example here. And most people look at it and say, well, OK, that's not for me. That's very weird. I will not do this. But actually, now with this context, it's not that bad. So what we can say is, well, we have a meta class called singleton. And this meta class keeps track of all the instances it has already created, meaning of all the classes it has already created. And now, whenever some class is created, so we have an, call, like an instance of the underlying class is created, so the call function is called, we only create this instance if it does not already exist. And if it already exists, we just return the previous instance. And now with this, um, what is it, seven lines of code, six lines of code, um, we can define tons of classes, just assign them the meta class singleton, and now, whenever we want to instantiate this class, we just instantiate it the first time. And every other time, we just get back the cached instance, which is in the meta class. So that's the Stack Overflow top hit for singletons in meta uh, in Python. Where are meta classes used otherwise? And they're actually mostly used in libraries where you need to somehow define APIs. And you do this as classes. So for example, in Pydantic, you define a base model, and this is like a class. To define a class, you have these class variables with type, uh, variable, and type, and so on. Or like in Object Relation Manager, like in Django ORM, you also define your database tables as a class. And so this is where actually meta classes come in, because you use the class syntax to define something, 
And then the library needs to understand or to define. It needs to have an overview of all the classes you have defined. And it needs to even modify these classes on the spot. Like in the Django ORM, it will then add functionalities as you can save these models, you can load them, you can search for them, and so on. And so in these libraries, they're heavily used. And that's where they should be used. So that's like the best use case for them. In most other cases, they should not. But as I said, we mostly do not need them. But actually, in concept, we had to use them. So that's where the two ends of the talk come together. Because Pydantic needs meta classes, and we wanted to wrap around Pydantic. And to do so, we had to actually wrap around the meta class of Pydantic. So what does this mean? The, I would say like one of the most important parts of ConfSet is this ConfSet meta class, which inherits from the meta class of the Pydantic base model. And to do so, since the meta class of Pydantic base model is not publicly exposed, I mean, it's, we could import it, but it would break. We just get the type of this Pydantic base model. So it looks very weird. So we inherit from the type of the other model. And by doing so, we create a meta class. So PyCharm has no chance of type checking this. It does not understand what's going on here at all. But what we have here is this singleton pattern. So we have the call function here, where we, I mean, singleton is like, a, let's say, negatively connotated name, but it's actually more, I would say, a lazy loading and caching. So What's happened here is that whenever you have already instantiated a config class, it will just like um, return the config class again, like the instance. And only if it was never loaded before, it will really actually load the config. And it is load config is then where all these loaders we have seen come in place, like the file loader, the environment variable loader, the command line arguments loader, and so on. And it also uses this to like load them if you do not provide a class variable and just like provide them as instance, uh, as keyword arguments. So with this concept meta class, we can wrap around the meta class of Pydantic. And then the concept class wraps around the class of Pydantic, like base model, and defines the meta class of the concept. And then we have the other stuff here, which is necessary, like the context matcher for the change config sources and so on. But basically, that's what's at the heart of ConfZ, is this meta class, which wraps around the meta class of Pydantic. This was it. Uh, I think I gained, oh no, I'm late, sorry. <laughs> oh, oh, I also did not check the sheets. Yes, thank you. <laughs>